General Business Order of the Day number 26, Plebiscite Future Migration Level Bill 2018, Second Reading Debate. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I ask the question, do you think the current rate of immigration to Australia is too high? Our rate of net immigration is a topic that has regularly made an appearance at the forefront of public debate in recent years, and so it should. Immigration impacts considerably on Australia's overall population growth, which in turn impacts on lifestyle we are all able to experience. It just makes common sense to understand that more people means more demand for services. If those services are not established at a pace that keeps up with the growth, then lifestyles will go backwards. And with the stagnant lifestyles ordinary Australians have been experiencing in the past decade, we certainly don't want things to get any worse. Raising an issue like immigration, in particular the idea of an immigration slowdown, also seems to attract those who want to drag the racism tag into the discussions. It's already happened with this bill, and I really expect nothing less from those who have already tossed this issue into the too hard basket and don't have the fortitude to tackle the difficult matters that affect the lives of all citizens and residents of Australia. As I have said previously, this bill is not about where people originate when they come to live in our great nation or why. It is strictly about the numbers and the impact those numbers, significant numbers on a global scale, mind you, are having on our lives here. Australia's considerable population growth has been linked quite publicly in recent years to various social issues. Infrastructure being unable to keep up with the population growth in our suburbs, services being unable to keep up with the increased demand that results from the collective needs of more people. Infrastructure Australia, an Australian government body, also notes these two concerns. It says, lags in infrastructure provision cost the economy, but they also affect people's quality of life. If you don't get the timing of new housing and infrastructure right, our growth centres risk being characterised by congested roads, overcrowded trains and buses, over-enrolment in schools, hospital bed shortages and constraints on community infrastructure. My next point. Our considerable population growth has been linked to high demand for housing and subsequently ever-rising house prices, which for many Australians now puts owning their own home further out of reach. And it's not just population growth generally. One OECD study notes very clearly that evidence suggests that changes in population growth stemming from increases in net migration tend to have a greater influence on real house prices in the medium term than natural increases. The great and dedicated Australian Dick Smith has spoken about this. Regarding the housing affordability crisis, very simply he said this. When you consider the scale of its impact on the problem, population growth gets very little scrutiny or debate relative to other causes involved. In fact, it is hardly acknowledged at all. So let me say it up front. Australia's immigration fuel population growth is a major cause of our country's housing affordability crisis. Mr Smith also has also noted the number of years that it now takes to save up for a house deposit by saying 10 per cent of an average wage in 1975, it was six years. In 2016, it is 25 years. They are all factors that highlight the impact of our high population growth on the ordinary Australian. The aspiration of owning a home is more and more at risk. And my final dot point. Population growth has also been linked to concerns about increased demands for jobs, stagnant wages growth and subsequent unemployment and underemployment. An ABC analysis noted, Australia currently has a population growth rate of around 1.6 per cent, more than double the rate of the United Kingdom and of the USA, and driven largely by immigration. Other sources suggest a similar figure of 1.7 per cent growth. The ABC analysis also noted the subsequent impacts on wages and jobs. It said, 
In the short term, an increase of the supply of labour through high migration should mean lower wages growth. And there are about 680,000 unemployed Australians and, and an additional 1 million Australians who have a job but would like to work more hours. It also, it's also been acknowledged that many of the jobs created these days in Australia are going to immigrants, further adding to the pressures on job seekers everywhere and their families. The Sydney Morning Herald recently noted in recent years many additional full-time jobs have been created, but it's equally true that many of those jobs have gone to immigrants and other new entrants to the labour force, meaning the rate of un unemployment hasn't fallen below 5 per cent. Despite these facts about our high population growth, there remains a belief in the Australian political and business sphere that high population growth is necessary to achieve high economic growth. Big business also loves high immigration. Big retailers like Harvey Norman love high immigration because it means more customers to buy their products. But the influence of Mr Harvey and other corporate leaders on the debate should be lessened, because the focus should be more on the quality of life of Australian residents and citizens rather than the hip pockets of big businesses. The UK experience is that, in the period from 1995 to 2011, mass migration had made the country very significantly poorer. There is a considerable difference between the value of the services they claimed and the amount of taxation they paid. The figure initially was estimated at a shortfall of $95 billion, but was later revised upwards to $114 billion before being raised further to £159 billion. The dot points I outlined suggest that the ordinary Australian, including Mr Morrison's quite Australians, may not necessarily be seen, be seen the supposed benefits of having more and more people coming here all seeking to be somehow satisfied in all these specific criteria. It is worth looking at the UK situation with regard to immigration, which has already been mirrored in some areas in Australia. Their population is some two and a half times that of Australia, and their net migration numbers are around the same as ours. Concern among citizens in UK over this figure and the impact it was having on life in the UK can be attributed considerably to the result of the Brexit vote in 2016. Australia's current net migration, according to the latest budget papers, is around 271,000 people. It's not the figure of 190,000 that was bandied around in March just prior to the election. But then why let the facts get in the way of a good story when an election is coming? New migrants to the UK have seen it as arriving almost in heaven. They have often arrived from nations where living conditions are poorer, so the conditions of their new home, even though they might be poor by UK standards, are wonderful in comparison. Jobs are potentially more readily available because they are often prepared to work for wages that are much lower than those in their previous country of origin. In the book, The Strange Death of Europe, author Douglas Murray notes that, high among the reasons why people flock to Europe are the knowledge that its welfare states will look after migrants who arrive and the knowledge that however long it takes or however poorly migrants may be looked after, they will still enjoy a better standard of living and a better roster of rights than anywhere else, let alone in their own countries. New migrant workers are an attractive option for business, to the demise of opportunities for existing <coughs> citizens and residents because of this mindset. We need to ensure the UK situation does not take hold more strongly here, so it's important that this issue is debated properly and that the facts and figures are clear for all to see. To use the terminology of Mr Murray, the situation, we'll see people at the lower end of that market edged out of jobs by people from countries where wages and living standards are far lower and who are therefore willing to work for lower pay. We have seen elements of that emerging in Australia, with some, mi 
with some migrants and overseas students' workers being exploited <coughs> because they either accept low wages or they are oblivious to our legal wage minimums. Either way, they are filling jobs at a lower rate than that of other Australian citizens and residents. <coughs> it is not good for those looking for work and it's not good for our economy. To add further to this situation, there is a high number of the migrants who are now experiencing and benefiting from the better living conditions of the UK, as they also do in Australia, who are sending money back to family members still living back in their poorer conditions in their former homelands. Mari again. The reality is that whatever its other benefits, the economic benefits of immigration occur almost solely to the migrant. It is migrants who are able to access public facilities that have not previously paid for. It is migrants who benefit from a wage higher than they could earn in their home country. And very often the money that they earn, or much of it, is sent to family outside the United Kingdom rather than being put back into the local economy. It's clear that economies of the host nation are impacted negatively by high rates of immigration. As I touched on earlier, the Australian Prime Minister recently spoke of the aspirations of Australians. Aspirations for a job, perhaps an apprenticeship, or to start their own business, to own a home and save for a comfortable retirement. These are typical traditional Australian aspirations. They are actually quite modest, but let's be honest, for many people they are slipping out of reach. In the past, they were almost a given. They were life's achievements, they were quite reachable if you had a stable job and lived a common sensible life. However, high immigration levels, among other things, are very much the cause of putting the barriers up that prevent these simple aspirations from actually being achieved. Since 2007, Australia's population grew by 5 million, an overall increase of 25 per cent. There are predictions that our population will grow further in the next 50 years to 50 million people. I believe it will be more if we keep going at the rate we're going. And quite alarmingly, 60 per cent of Australia's population growth from 2006 to 2016 16 came from immigration. The impacts of immigration on areas of provision of services, employment, home ownership and the like also had noticeable impacts on other aspects of life that are starting and building a family. Mr Murray notes that in the UK the majority of new births are from immigrants rather than existing citizens and residents. If it is agreed that a particular country wishes to maintain a stable or slowly growing population, then before importing people from other states it would surely be more sensible to determine whether there are reasons why people in your own country are not at present having enough children. He adds, only three types of people now have three children or more, the very rich, the very poor and recent immigrants. Is the high rate of growth by immigration good or bad? Well, with all these facts and figures on the table, I think it's a legitimate topic to debate. So I'll come back to my original question. Do you think the current rate of immigration to Australia is too high? I believe I know the answer, but I think all Australians, those who live and breathe the consequences of our population growth every day, those who drive the congested roads, the crowded buses and trains, and are stuck in the rental roundabout because house prices just keep rising while wage levels remain dormant. It is those people who should be given the chance to vote on this issue so we can find out once and for all what the people really think. In my previous speech on this topic, I noted that the Lowy Institute survey reported a sharp spike in anti-immigration sentiment in 2018 caused in its annual sentiment measure to change from positive to negative. The 2017 Scanlon survey reported 37 per cent of respondents see the current immigration intake as too high, but when respondents remained anonymous, 74 per cent said the Australia, that Australia did not need any more people. In the same year, the Australian Population Research Institute found 54 per cent of respondents who were Australian voters wanted the number of immigrants reduced. 
So let's do a proper vote. Let every voter have a say and find out what all the people think together. That's what I am proposing in this bill, the plebiscite Future Migration Level Bill 2018. I am proposing that a plebiscite be held, coinciding with the next federal election to ensure better convenience and to reduce costs to ask all Australians their views on this high impact issue. Let Australians be allowed to cast a vote, yes or no, and so collectively reveal if they believe our immigration rates are, in fact, too high. From there, we can determine what needs to be done to our immigration processes to make any changes that will have the flow-on effect that improves general livability in Australia, employment, housing affordability, less crowding in schools and hospitals, and similar issues. The Prime Minister has previously raised the issue of an immigration cap to keep net migration to Australia at 160,000. Suggestions by former Prime Minister Tony Abbott, following in my lead, that the figure should be cut further, perhaps as low as 110,000. I have even commented as low as 75,000 till we actually can, can get our infrastructure and services for the Australian people and clean up our own backyard. We are met by concern as to whether it would blow out Australia's deficit further. The comments all add to the many mixed opinions and viewpoints that have contributed to this debate on this issue in the past. So is the current rate of immigration to Australia too high? Let's put this simple question to the people. If the people in this parliament or the government have got the guts to do it, let's hold the plebiscite, hold it to coincide with the next federal election so we keep the cost down. Let's not sit on our hands on this issue any longer and take steps to understand exactly what the people think and then act with confidence with the resulting useful information. I put a post yesterday on my Facebook page, Pauline Hanson's Please Explain, flagging this plebiscite, and in less than 24 hours it received more than 7,100 comments. That is quite staggering, but shows very clearly that people want to have their say on this matter. With all the politicians having their input, big business and researchers having a say, and academics putting in their two cents worth about immigration, don't you think it's time for everyday Australians to also be heard? That, after all, um, is what democracy is all about. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak against the private senator's bill put forward by Senator Hanson. There's nothing noble about this bill. It's long on alarmism and short on realism. No surprises, perhaps, given that it has come from you know, the party that has tried to push their anti-immigration agenda by moving a motion that praised the North Sentinelese tribe's strict zero immigration policy. Yes, the same tribe that killed American missionary John Chow last year. My apologies. I'm not here to question the motives behind the bill. They pale in comparison to the weak arguments upon which the bill is built. Senator Hanson has said, our immigration policy is like a horse that has lost its rider. It's dangerous. What we need is a rider, a population policy to safely guide the immigration horse. Can I tell you that everything, and I mean everything, the government does in this space, it does with the Australian people in mind. The Treasurer has an entire department. There is a tax office which looks at how many people we have who is working, who isn't, how long we'll have those workers doing so, or how long until we get some more, where those workers are and what they're earning to guide tax collection and spending. And they're not working in the dark. The Australian Bureau of Statistics falls under the auspices of the Treasurer too. Likewise, the Health Minister looks at the population. Where are our older people? Where are the unvaccinated children? Where do we need more doctors? I think you get the idea, but to help Senator Hanson understand just how much the Health Minister can read these things in real time, 
The Health Insurance Commission also collects statistics on the matter. If a person gets the flu and goes to the doctor before they go to bed for a week, we'll know about it. When that person becomes a number in the Australian Influenza Surveillance Report, it helps to inform our decision making. In case you're wondering, there's been 153,272 cases of influenza this year, up to the 14th of July. Indeed, many people are probably uncomfortable with the amount of data that's being collected about Australians with a view to managing population and service delivery. But all of this shows that it isn't the government's first rodeo on this stuff. We understand the flow-on effects of population growth on the economy, on services, on Australians' day-to-day -day lives. Every day, members of the team in Cabinet and the Ministry in our backbench are looking at population and adjusting policy and spending to deal with population changes. And to top it all off, we have the Population Centre of Excellence gathering all of that data, comparing it against Australians' needs, and that's now and in the future, and also comparing it against other international options. We have a clear immigration policy. It's called a plan for Australia's future population. Creative, that one. And it manages Australia's immigration program in the short, medium and long term. Our plan reduces the permanent migration program cap by 15 per cent, from 190,000 places to 160,000 places per year. That will make 120,000 fewer permanent visas available over the next four years. Senator Hanson is concerned, it seems, that certain regions of our major cities have higher percentages of people who were born overseas. The government recognises that 75 per cent of Australia's entire population growth occurs at this point in time in our major cities. That's why our population plan encourages more new migrants to settle outside of our big cities and in smaller cities and in regional areas. We're incentivising regional migration with two new regional visas for skilled workers, the Skilled Employer Sponsored Regional Visa and the Skilled Work Regional Visa. Migrants on these visas will need to demonstrate that they have lived and worked in regional Australia for three years before they can apply for permanent residency, and 23,000 places have been set aside from the total for these regional visas. And of course, that is in the hope and the expectation that they will fall in love with all of the wonderful things that rural and regional Australia has to offer. We've set up new $15,000 scholarships to be made available to over 1,000 international and domestic students to study in regional Australia, again knowing that they will find it irresistible. And international students studying at regional universities will have access to an extra year in Australia on a post-study work visa. Senator Hanson has argued that one of the biggest drawbacks of higher immigration is greater congestion and loss of amenity in our main cities. And I acknowledge that's something that many people are concerned about. That's part of the reason why the government is investing a record $100 billion, not million, billion, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, in infrastructure over the next 10 years. Some examples of projects we're funding that will cut congestion in Australia's cities include $3.5 billion for the Western Sydney Rail, $2 billion for fast rail to be built between Geelong and Melbourne, and $1 billion to upgrade the M1 in Queensland, as, long as, as well as exploration of fast rail heading to the Sunshine Coast, also in my home state. We've quadrupled funds for further road congestion busting projects through the Urban Congestion Fund from $1 billion up to $4 billion. And we're working with the states and territories to deliver vital infrastructure projects that match local population need. We've made population management a fixture of COAG discussions. And I think that's a significant cultural change in the way people are approaching this issue. The Centre for Population that's been um, referred to earlier in my address so far um, is something that's been established inside Treasury. And $23.4 million has been provided to establish that centre. There's about 20 people working in there doing nothing but looking at population. And they will provide detailed analysis and advice on population issues now and into the future to help make sure we have an informed debate on these subjects. 
All of these elements of our plan will help to ease population pressures in our major capitals, while helping to fill employment gaps in our smaller cities and regions and help to grow their economies. Because that's what a sensible rate of immigration does. It helps to build our economic prosperity. But not once does Senator Hanson's bill address the need to ensure that we have economic prosperity and the role that immigration plays in ensuring that, both in our past and in our future. At this point in time, there is a necessity of immigration at some level to ensure our high economic performance and Australians' high expectations of living standards. Senator Hanson says that a majority of Australians would say the immigration rate is too high if they were told 62 per cent of the population increase in the decade to 2016 was the result of immigration. And, well, that may be so. But what would Australians say about our immigration level if they were told, more honestly, that overwhelmingly migrants have added to our nation by stimulating stronger growth? by creating jobs in our economy, by oftentimes doing jobs that Australians don't seem to want to do, and to helping to, in helping to slow the overall ageing of the Australian population. A comprehensive research paper released by Treasury and the Department of Home Affairs last year found exactly this. It cites International Monetary Fund research showing our immigration program in its current state will add up to one percentage point to GDP growth each year from 2020 to 2050. The report found that our immigration programs focus on skilled migrants of working age, because that's important, we do need to be developing the skills base in this country, helped to limit the economic impact of Australia's ageing population. The contribution of these skilled migrants has lifted the standard of living here by 0.1 per cent of GDP per capita increased productivity by 10 per cent, something quite disproportionate, I'd suggest, and raised the workforce participation rate. Skilled migrants granted permanent visas in 2014 to 15 alone are estimated to make a combined lifetime tax contribution of almost $7 billion. But here's the kicker. The Treasury paper warns that if the current rate of migration is not maintained, we risk significantly lower economic growth and a substantial drop in Australians' living standards. You have to wonder whether those from One Nation plan to put that research before the Australian people if this mooted plebiscite were to go ahead. But of course it won't. The government understands and those opposite understand and Senator Hanson should understand that the fundamentals of this bill are flawed. I acknowledge there are those in the community who hold concerns about our immigration levels, and I hear from them often. But it's no wonder they're scared when there's divisive rhetoric that is put forward by some in this chamber. Now, I've got concerns about plebiscites, fundamentally because it's our job to make the calls on these things to do the research, to gather the data, to make the fair and balanced case and ultimately to make decisions and rise and fall on whether we get them right. I'm not a fan of there being a sustained practice of getting anything that's in the too hard basket and farming it out to a plebiscite. But putting that aside, it's not necessary because this government has a plan for responsible levels of immigration to reduce immigration as far as Senator Hanson proposes, down to just 70,000 people a year, would pose a major risk to our economy. It risks our AAA credit rating. It risks our record economic growth at a time where there is global uncertainty. It risks the headway that we have made to boost our economy with the passage of our personal income ta ta tax cuts package. Over 320,000 jobs were created under this government over the last year. Employment has grown for 11 straight months, with unemployment down to 5.1 per cent. The participation rate is at a record high of 65.8 per cent, 
last quarter, the economy grew by 0.4 per cent, bringing the yearly growth rate to 1.8 per cent. We are in our 28th year of uninterrupted annual economic growth. Are there challenges ahead? Sure. But that's all the more reason why we shouldn't jeopardise that steady, positive performance. And until all Australians experience the benefits of that growing economy, until Australians are feeling the benefits of rising wages as well as more job opportunities, we cannot rest. This bill seeks to affirm a policy that would put all of this economic improvement at risk. Why would we ask the Australian people to support a policy that is so plainly against their own economic interests? This country can attribute much of its economic success to our immigration program, of course in combination with other activities. And our growing numbers are being managed successfully through the government's population plan. This bill endorses a solution that would have catastrophic cons consequences for our economy for a problem that is already being addressed by this government in a sensible, measured and long-sighted way. And for that reason, I cannot support it. Thank you, Senator Soker. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise also today to speak against Senator Hanson's private member's bill. As senators will remember, when this bill was initially introduced in the last parliament, Labor opposed it vigorously. Our position has not changed. The plebiscite does not do anything other than provide a question. No definitive outcome on immigration rates or levels, regardless of what the outcome of the vote is. We recognise that the story of our country, the story of us, is tied to our heritage as a migration nation. Migrants come to Australia. A lot do. But they come here in search of a better life, not just for themselves but for their families. And why wouldn't they? After all, we live in the greatest country on earth. Today, nearly half of all Australians were born either overseas or have at least one parent that was. In my own case, my parents came here in the late 1960s because they knew that Australia was one where they could work hard, get ahead and create a future for their children. They're not alone, Mr President. They join roughly seven and a half million others since the end of World War II. We owe much of our prosperity as a nation to those who made this journey. Indeed, the Australia that we all know and enjoy today simply would not have been possible were it not for the contribution of people who were born overseas and their children and grandchildren. Senator Hanson has ignored the benefits of migration, particularly the economic benefits. Migrants have helped to drive our economy. One in three small businesses in Australia are run by migrants, and migrant owners employ around 1.4 million workers right across Australia. As outlined by Treasury in the April 2018 report, shaping a nation. The contribution to our economy by migrant intake alone was worth $10 billion over five years. That same report stated, migration improves the Commonwealth's fiscal position since migrants are likely to contribute more to tax revenue than they claim in social services or other government support. In my home state of Victoria, one can barely walk down a mall or shopping strip without seeing the value that migrants make to our economy. But central to the defence against the kind of divisiveness proposed in this bill is not merely the important role that migration plays in, in our economy. Rather, it is an advance in the vision that we all have for this great nation. In Melbourne, what would Ligon Street be without the coffee machines brought over the seas by migrants from Italy? What would Box Hill be without its numerous dumpling restaurants opened by Chinese migrants who wanted to make something for themselves? What would Oakley be without the smell of roasting meat cooked in traditional Greek way 
gently waffling down Eaton Mall. Labor understands that Australians are frustrated with stagnant wages, unaffordable housing and clogged infrastructure. However, migrants are not to blame. The truth is, Mr Acting Deputy President, that this nation would not be what it is today without the contributions made to it by those who have come here in hope of making a great contribution to Australia. It is not for us to subject this to a divisive and perfectly, honestly speaking, a hurtful plebiscite. Whilst Labor accepts that this is important, that we make sure that we get the balance right in managing our migration program, this is the responsibility of the government with the best advice at hand. There is simply no place in our inclusive and proudly diverse nation for an expensive opinion poll on questions that don't need to be asked. Thank you, Senator Cain. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the question that the bill be read a second time be now put. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The division required. Ring the bells. Order. I've just been informed that that um, uh, the noes were not voicing it, and so with the consensus of the Senate, we will cancel this division. Is there any objection to that? There being no objection, Senator Roberts. I would like to see a division, please, Mr. Senator Roberts. The the I make the point that um, everyone is supporting you on this. Okay. As far as I'm advised, so the question is that the motion be put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bill be read a second time. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Hanson as teller for the eyes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the nose. Order. The result of the division there being two ayes and 54 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Thank you. Before I call the clerk, I'll wait for people to absent themselves or move around the chamber as necessary. <coughs> 